uh, good morning to everyone uh, who is participating in the Netherlands and uh, good afternoon everyone uh, who is more in the eastern part of the world connected. Um, fantastic to be at uh, Green Tech. Uh, I'm a bit jealous um, that I cannot participate myself. On the other hand, already very privileged that uh, I put, can participate online. It's my first time. And I think uh, we have a very interesting uh, topic today to, to discuss and to go a bit deeper into opportunities in, in crop protection uh, in Vietnam. And let me start explaining a little bit about the relation between Vietnam and the, and the Netherlands. Um, I think we have a very strong mutual trade relationship, uh, which is growing every year. A lot of commodities uh, from Vietnam uh, are exported to the Netherlands and also vice versa, including also uh, a lot of technology and knowledge. Uh, with the government of Vietnam, we have a very strong and rich uh, strategic partnership arrangement on sustainable agriculture and on food security, signed by both prime ministers in 2014. And that also provides us a framework uh, with uh, discussing with uh, the, the government uh, on, on mutual topic of on different topics. Uh, and one of the aims is also to stimulate mutual trade and to work on public private partnerships. Um, I think the ambitions of Vietnam are, are big, especially to become uh, a, a regional and maybe global food player. And they are uh, looking also to the Netherlands as an example. Uh, so the image, I think, of the Netherlands is good. Uh, though they are uh, facing challenges uh, li like, uh, like, like we in the Netherlands as well. But in Vietnam, I think it concerns quality of products, food safety, uh, fulfilling standards, and also to work further on sustainability. So climate change is a big topic, um, uh, biosecurity, uh, biosecurity uh, but also water issues. So um, these are also the teams, I think, where we strongly uh, are connected in, in collaboration into different kinds of projects. And also Dutch... Uh, expertise, uh, I think, can contribute to overcoming this, uh, these challenges. Um, I think when we look to, uh, to the Netherlands, uh, expertise, uh, strong collaboration between partners, but also boosting innovation can be an example uh, for uh, Fjord, uh, Vietnam. <laughs> I think fits also very well in the new policy of the Ministry of Agriculture in the Netherlands to become much more a front runner in sustainable agriculture and to provide knowledge and technology in, uh, in third countries. So that was also the reason why we asked Larif and Open Asia to conduct studies uh, on the local needs in Vietnam to overcome sustainability challenges and also on the Netherlands side to, uh, to find possibilities for Dutch supply that can overcome these challenges. Um, important areas, I think, to look at in Vietnam or uh, the south in the Mekong Delta, where we have a very strong collaboration on an agricultural transformation, uh, which strong Dutch engagement but also in the Central Highlands, where there's a, a big uh, horticultural hub of Vietnam is because it's a little bit higher and also the climate is suitable to do covered uh, production. Um, I think when we look to, to uh, the Dutch participants, uh, also Vietnam at the moment, I think is an interesting time uh, to step in. They are developing to, of have they been developing to a middle income country. They have these strong uh, ambitions. They know how to move into the right direction. Uh, two years ago, an um, uh, EVFTA, European Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, has been signed, which I think makes it also easier to, uh, to work together. So uh, that is, let's say, a, a, a small kickoff uh, that I wanted to give. I'm very uh, curious to hear the results of the, of the studies. And also hope to hear uh, opportunities for collaboration with Vietnam and maybe also with Dutch uh, companies to especially work on the reduction of agrochemicals. Uh, and I think that is definitely and specifically a topic where a lot of uh, gain uh, can be reached in Vietnam and also something where we are quite strong in, in the Netherlands especially on integrated pest management. So if we can find and identify the right companies and knowledge institutes together, 
I'm sure there is enough ground in Vietnam uh, to, to find the right partners and, and to build uh, a really nice uh, consortium. So that's where I want to stop. I will listen and uh, hope to see you all uh, one day in Vietnam. And uh, good luck with the rest of the seminar. So back to the moderator. Thank you, Willem. And a big thank you for everybody being present here this morning at the Green Tech. Good morning, everyone. It's 10 o'clock Dutch time and the third day of the Green Tech is opening as we speak. So people are slowly coming in. And a big thank you to everybody present in Vietnam, uh, the Netherlands and elsewhere. Given that we're at the Green Tech, a couple of uh, household webinar rules, if you will. Part of the uh, participants are actually exhibiting today. So we'll be re recording this session and it'll be available uh, afterwards as well. Um, second on, we're very happy to have a combination of speakers today. On my left, not visible for you, is Manuel Madani from Priva, Hi. Southeast Asia. And on your screen, on our screen here as well, is Min Tam, all the way from Ho Chi Minh. Um, and I'll be assisted by Amber on the technique here at the Green Tech. Um, again, um, we would ask you for interactivity to ask any questions in the chat box and for the audience out here to save any questions that you have till after the speakers. And then we'll try to get those questions in the chat box since we have part of the audience online and part of the audience here. Um, and we'll try to combine both. So any of your questions um, can go in the chat box um, if you're participating online. Omar, next slide, please. Thank you. And thank you again, uh, Willem, for giving a bit of the background. And indeed, um, what we are talking about here is a two-part study, which was commissioned by Willem and his team in Vietnam um, in the second quarter of 2021, actually breaking it down in two uh, sections, one being an overview of the sector in the Netherlands, which was completed in the midst of the pandemic in October 2021. And at the same time, Min Tam and her team completed an overview of the Vietnamese sector. And again, very much tying into that question that Willem was just asking. So what is the opportunities for collaboration between Vietnam and the Netherlands in terms of bio, uh, let's say biological control agents, IPM, and the reduction of agrochemicals in horticulture? So today we'll be taking you through both of the findings, trying to combine uh, a little bit of the insights that Manuel will bring from his company perspective and Min Tam will bring from Vietnam from her research perspective. Next slide, please. So a short overview, and I shouldn't be telling anything new to anybody here in the audience, but 2019 figures, there was 97 point, uh, 97 million people in Vietnam. I checked this morning, it was actually up to 90, 8.9 today, so we're getting close to the magic number of 100 million people. I'm not saying anything new to anybody here when I say it's a very, very fast growing economy. And for those here at the Green Tech, horticulture and flor uh, floriculture are a solid growing sector. For all of you who have been to Dalat and Lamdong province, you've seen the developments uh, rapidly uh, increasing over the last 10 years specifically give or take a factor 10 um, up to 2018, where there's now a roughly 4 billion US dollar market. And as that market grows, and as development grows, um, part of that open field production that you would see 10 years ago is now going to more protected cultivation, very much um, poly houses, um, let's say the first step towards poly houses, so not the glass type of production that you would see here, but the development is certainly taking place. Um, with that um, also comes a bit of an overview of the agrochemical market. And um, that market itself since 1950 has grown about a hundredfold as in the imported chemicals coming in mainly from China and other Asian companies have grown a factor 100 to roughly 4,000 uh, registered products today. Um, so what you see is that most of those products are really aimed at what you would call traditional family growers, right? So what we would call family businesses. Um, and that actually drives a lot of the production, um, both the domestic consumption, but also now with the Europe-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, 
um, part of that production, especially from the larger companies, going to export. Now, when we look at that export market, we're talking mainly tropical fruits, uh, the high-end varieties, if you will. Um, and um, also nothing new here for those who have gone through the pandemic, including yourself, Manuel, is that there were some significant lockdowns in Vietnam, which have really hurt uh, part of the export, also due to regional lockdowns and logistical issues. That being said, on the positive side, as we're all seated here, um, Vietnam is expected to make a full recovery. And vis-a-vis -vis its neighbor China, of course, the developments are very, very positive, including from an investment perspective, eh, where China is still very much closed from a logistical perspective, but also from a personal person travel perspective, Vietnam is rapidly opening up to both trade and people. Next slide. Yes, I was already getting ahead of myself, but indeed the use of pesticides has increased exponentially by a factor 100 since the 1950s. And of course, rampant use um, causes issues, environmental issues, health problems. Mm. Um, and at the same time, Vietnam is also facing a less, um, let's say, resilient climate in terms of the differences in temperature, rainfall, etc., which which heavily affect especially outdoor crops. So far, the government policies to let's say, restrict and restrain the use of uh, pesticides have been relatively ineffective. And at this particular stage, the government, the MARD, uh, is actually aiming to reduce the number of pesticides brands by 30%. But again, today's situation is more than 4,000 registered brand names. Mm. So what you see is there's quite a cocktail use of of ingredients and having done many many interviews in in the field itself um, when you actually talk to the farmers the effective use of those uh, pesticides mm -hmm. is, is very very hard for themselves to uh, to regulate due to a, a lack of knowledge quite often present so regulation would be very much welcomed Right. So looking at the Netherlands, um, when we look at the biological product categories, we can actually break them down into three different categories. On the left, you'll find bio fertilizers, often referred to as microbials, as the uh, MPK alternatives, if you will, the bio MPA alternatives. Second, there's bio stimulants, so aimed at improving the health life of the soil, if you will, and very much from a preventative perspective. So assuring that you have stronger plants who are better able to resist diseases. And thirdly, also being the biggest category, the biological control products. Um, so microbials, biopesticides, um, of which the biopesticides, at least in the Dutch environment, make up roughly 50% of the market. So out of the three, being the largest component by far. Right. So. Horticulture in the Netherlands, um, I think very much known, but globally renowned for high-tech innovative solutions and a total sector value at uh, estimated 2018 of roughly 21 billion, uh, i.e. roughly 2.7% 7 of the Dutch GDP. So a significant uh, sector and anybody who's come in flying in for the green tech coming over the Westlands, they will have seen the tremendous amount of greenhouses. It is a powerhouse globally, both floriculture and horticulture. With developments, of course, shared here these three days on uh, the green tech, including everything from solar energy, light saving measures, geothermal applications, and more sustainable ways of farming, uh, having taken very much the forefront uh, the last three days or at mm. the far at the, the green tech. Mm. Right, so what does the sector look like in the Netherlands when we talk to about the alternatives uh, in terms of agrochemicals? So on the one hand, there's of course equipment manufacturers and greenhouse construction companies where you need a closed environment quite often to really drive the efficiency of biological control agents. Um, so closed systems to reduce the risk of diseases and pests. But then spread out over those three sectors that we just mentioned um, as a spread across the sector. On the biological control agents, a host of companies, uh, including Benfried and Biobest, Entocare, corporate most well known across the sector, 
New Farm Volto and Van Ypres. In terms of biofertilizers, I think most of them, if not all, also present here today. Uh, Biocultura, Biocompig, BVB substrates, and several others, including Crodon. And then the sector of biostimulants, really focused uh, uh, around the seeds themselves, right? So again, let's say OP and hybrid varieties of seeds. Um, companies also including Incotech doing the uh, coating of seeds. Mm -hmm. So very much focused on how can you get better quality products um, from the start, needing less agrochemicals uh, in the growth process. Next slide. Then, of course, the public stakeholders also play a significant role, both in legislation, but also in development and driving out a part of those uh, uh, innovations, either on the European uh, platform or internationally. So we have several influential public stakeholders, all of which are listed here. Um, but for all of you participating, we have a full list of those development partners and public partners registered in the report, which is available both at the embassy and online. Next slide. Right, certification. So I already mentioned the European Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, but of course, when you want to export certification, then comes in as a very, very important driver. So um, one of the main things heard back in Vietnam was of course, okay, these certifications are both expensive and hard to go through. So they're very much hampering our export, if you will. Um, but in general, global, gap being applied um, most throughout the sector for those who are currently already exporting. Whereas Viet Gap today um, is often not yet recognized by retailers outside of Vietnam. And hence you find very much a drive towards the global gap for those large enough to export and trying to meet the certification schemes of the retailers. Now, when we look at the European retailers, uh, they also tend to be more stringent than the rules applied. Uh, for example, little here in, in Europe saying that in terms of residues, um, only 33% of the maximum amount of volumes are acceptable by them. So having the certifications alone is not enough. Certain retailers also demand more. Um, for example, when we talk about the residues and the willingness to allow um, less than the residue maximum that are stated by the regulations. Right, so just to give a few recommendations, um, what we noticed uh, in the interviews coming back from the farmers that there was very much a knowledge, a lack of knowledge on how to properly apply IPM and the products and services that come with that. Um, changing habits are not an easy thing, thing to do, especially because mm. let's say oftentimes we say farmers may be um, some of the most conservative groups of growers out there, right? Um, and coming back to what Willem was saying, um, working together hand in hand with a group of Vietnamese and Dutch companies to really uh, focus on showing, not telling, was an issue that was brought up quite often in both the interviews in the Netherlands and in Vietnam where you have comparative demonstrations with, let's say, a field on the left and a field on the right, taking the same crop and a different approach, as um, trying to convince from paper tends to be very, very inefficient. Mm. Next slide for time purposes. Yeah, so some of the recommendations uh, listed across the value chain from inputs all the way down con to consumers again, would come down to working very much to co uh, together between providers of the alternatives to agrochemicals. And at the same time, those producers in Vietnam that already have an export business or are focusing on the European market as an export business. For purposes of time, I'm going to hand over the word to Min Tam, who is sitting in Ho Chi Minh and has performed the research on the Vietnamese side. Min Tam. Minta, can you hear us? Sorry. Or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. First of all, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you very much for the giving of Open Asia the opportunity to conduct the research on the very, I would say, the very meaningful, uh, meaningful assignment for our team. So uh, we can start by giving a few words on the agriculture sector in Vietnam. 
So uh, the production overview of the horticulture in Vietnam, one of the key characteristics we have just mentioned is the dominance of the very small scale families household in Vietnam scattering uh, in during the cultivation area along the country. We see that in uh, this is the dominant of some small uh, hold, holders have created inconsistent in quality of supply and they're very high post harvest loss, which is a two major issue in Vietnam, along with the residue and contamination risk when it comes to the out export. So uh, overall in the production area, we see that uh, the uh, production area for articulture sectors has been increasing year on year and reaching by 2 million of hectares by 2021. Uh, but among the 2 million hectares, we see that only around 10 to 15 percent of the land were certified by the lower gap and the big gap, but mostly is the big gap. Uh, Mekong Delta also remained the largest horticulture region in the country, but most of the farm in Mekong Delta was still the traditional and open field external crop. When Lam Dong and the Lak cities in the highlands had increasing become the high tech horticulture hub for the country, during to the sum of the advantage from the temperature as well as also from the private investment, and also of the rinse house and all of the uh, all of the advanced technologies were applied mostly in the Lam Dong province. Uh, in terms of the breakdown for vegetable and fruit, we see that uh, around one hectare uh, of land is for the vegetable farming and another one hectare is for fruits. Uh, the total cultivation use recorded around 18, millions, uh, 18 million tons for fresh fruit uh, for vegetable and around 13 million uh, tons for fruit. Um, when we identify why, why is the issue that led into the residue and contamination risk uh, with the Vietnamese export, horticulture export, we identify that the fragmented value chains and the lack of knowledge and sustainability awareness is the main reason. It leads into the risk that we encounter today. We will elaborate it further in later slide. Please, uh, next slide, please, Amber. Uh, just a picture to show you the rowing, a very healthy row for the uh, Vietnamese horticultures in terms of the uh, cultivation land, cultivation land, and also in terms of the production use for vegetable and fruit years on years. Yes, next slide, please. Ah. I think in the next slide that we want to present a little bit on the export, uh, to say that mostly of the local horticulture segment were serving the domestic, the export in the recent years has also very thriving in the, with the Vietnamese uh, with the Vietnamese horticulture product. So basically, uh, the export were reached around three by eight, five to three point eight billion US dollar uh, from 2020s during to the COVID, and uh, it's also uh, one of the major trends is the stricter the changing in regulation of the China in post into the Vietnamese product that led into the little bit decrease in 2021. Uh, so uh, in 2021, we reached around like 3.2 billion of the total uh, article to export. Uh, in terms of destination, China is remain our major, uh, the largest uh, counterpart, export counterparts, where half of the product will, were, was export to China. Uh, but EU, EU and the US and Japan also arising the very important export counterpart for Vietnam with around 5%, represent around 5%. Uh, in terms of uh, vegetable and fruit export by type, we see that fresh fruit, because uh, the tropical fruits from the Vietnamese account for around like three fourths of the total export in terms of value uh, falling by the processed product like processed fruit and also the, the fresh vegetable is also very limited. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, very zooming to the export to EU for the horticulture product. We see that the, the horticulture export EU is increasing sharply uh, until like, uh, into 2021, we reached around 177 million US dollar, the total export to EU. Uh, the Netherlands represent around 45% of the total export to EU, paving the way into the other EU destination. And uh, some other key ma ma major market is including France, Germany, and UK. Uh, we, well, while we export to the EU, the fresh fruit, again, accounted for the majority of around 52, 54%, while the processed product, mostly all of the puree form, like the passion fruit, is also increasing and around, achieving around 35%. Uh, where fresh vegetable is very limited, around 10%. We identify one of the main challenges 
uh, regarding to the export to the EU is the quality of the supply. So we're the biggest problem with the Vietnamese horticulture product. We've got to answer the problem with the banned substances, the residual level as we mentioned, and also uh, on the operation side is the high logistic cost, which is also impacting the challenge for, for the Vietnamese uh, product into the EU. The next slide, please. So uh, as everyone has just mentioned about the EVFTA, I have to say that before the EVFTA, the, uh, the local, the Vietnamese horticulture product will impose around 10 to 20% for the tariff, but now 95% of the product will be, uh, the product will be eliminated thanks into the EVFTA. We'll have the forecast that export to EU will expect to increase around 50% at least, a minimum following the EVFTA, which is very significant uh, to the Vietnamese horticulture products in particular. Uh, we do see that EVFTA bring a lot of enormous competitive advantage for Vietnamese product versus other neighbor who has also sharing the same offering that we have. Uh, but also at the same time, EVFTA giving, I would say that give us a chance and because they offer a lot of challenge and require a lot of improvement for the Vietnamese product to match to restrict import standard, which is also the highest in the world, especially in terms of the food safety and contaminants and residual level. Some of the product that you see on the chart, this is the leading uh, export product to the EU, just mentioned is uh, passion fruit, dragon fruit, lambs, or some of the coconut and pineapple for the processed product. Next slide, please. Uh, when we mentioned about uh, from, from the all of the crop crop disease in Vietnam for the fruit and vegetable, uh, we see that uh, the market we identify the four main, most common crop disease that uh, we encounter is the insect, fungus, wisp, and rodents. They all combining around like seven more than seventy five percent of the, the disease that encounter in, in Vietnam. Some very common disease that we have mentioned is like the uh, pets, uh, forestiums, broom disease, brown spot disease, rodent damage, so especially the rodent damage is you lost up to around 15%. Some to the special of the rough. Yes. Uh, a very uh, quiet, uh, we try to introduce a little bit uh, more practical approach for the uh, for the agriculture sector in Vietnam. We mentioned about the stakeholder here, the value chains of the product. You see that uh, uh, this is the two main points I want to share on this slide. The first one is the role of the crop protection agent and dealer. So you see here that's most of the farming input from fertilizer, crop protection product, we're selling through the crop protection agents by regions um, because uh, not only uh, not only pro providing the product, but they also providing the credit line and some other program, which is very important for the farm, especially for the small scale farm. And uh, due to the fragmented uh, in the farming, we are farming a lot of the dominance of the small scale farmer. They have been formed together into cooperative farm. That is why it created inconsistent in quality of supply. <laughs> And the, the farm is the one who have fully uh, the authority to determine de 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 on the input for their farming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, another role is the middleman, but uh, yes. Uh, from, I think the next slide is good. Uh, I'm ref thank you. Uh, uh, a very natural into the crop protection market in Vietnam. I say that uh, uh, to a very private research, we see that the average usage of crop protection product in Vietnam was around 3.8 kg per hectare of cultivated area. This is number by 2020s. Around $1 billion, up, uh, $1 billion of the crop protection product we import into Vietnam was like with combining both generic and also premium product. Uh, 50, more than 50% of the crop protection products are imported from China. So they import it and then doing the diluting and repackaging to serve the, the market. Uh, some uh, Vietnamese also doing some, uh, some of the export of the crop protection product. So uh, I just mentioned that the crop protection product will has been around 4,000 trade name resistor in which by a product was account only around 700 NAM. So only around like 18% is by product was also remain very limited. And uh, the use of biological products remain very low. In 2020s, they measure that the total biological product pesticide you nationwide was only around 9,000 9, tons. But mostly of the using is used for the rice crop rather than for horticultural crop. 
So I think this is very significant that really allow opportunities for, 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 for the alternative for the art, uh, within the articulture sector in Vietnam. Next slide, Lee. Uh, again, for the use of the for the for the for the reduction of the agrochemical usage from perspective of the government, as a voucher also shared that the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development with their plan to reduce the numbers of chemical pesticides by 30% by 2025 and trying to replacing them with the byproducts to and also encourage to improve the rates of new biological pesticide to 20%. So the government has been uh, implemented few development program by the pilot program among the local crop protection companies. And, uh, and more, the most important thing for the Dutch, uh, our Dutch stakeholder is that now the biopesticide and correct to register on, on crop. The regulators have reduced number of testing or of the technical doc document registration costs in terms uh, comparing to the conventional pesticide registration product. This is a very green light that welcome all of the biology uh, in Vietnam. Yes. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the EU uh, regulation, I think that uh, that uh, three of the uh, main the main uh, standard that uh, EU have imposed into the Vietnamese market uh, is Vietnamese horticulture products. The first one is only on the top issue that we encounter is in the maximum residue level. This is the most common that's been rejected from the Vietnamese product. And uh, the second is the phytosanitary certificate for this uh, finish, uh, test and also the traceability. Uh, in the very sum, in the very summaries on the on the potential of the articulture sectors for the all the the crop protection uh, crop protection product from from the Netherlands that we try to summarize what is the trend and witnesses of the articulture sector in Vietnam. So on the strand I've already shared that now is the the, the, the sector is growing. It's remained a very key pillar into the Vietnamese uh, agriculture and also to the export in in the next coming year. Uh, the, the, the agriculture in Vietnam also benefited from the recent FDA that Vietnam was always the active member, uh, active member, including the EVFTA. Uh, we will also have the support of the government and also from the regulators to providing a lot of uh, uh, promotion, uh, promoting and also incentive program to promote it for high-tech projects, coming. and um, um uh, numerous of policy has been in place to also to reduce, reduce agrochemical in Vietnam by limited the registration and also new rural to improve us mostly on the domestic use it rather than in, in the export scale. But in the, in the coming time, it's also, also coming in place that uh, we have to impose a higher standard on the, on the local production. Uh, in terms of witnesses, uh, when we mentioned about witnesses, I think one of the most uh, very important uh, factor that lead into the, the factors of residue and uh, residue level is that the habit of use it. The habit of use it, the traditional farmers on agriculture chemical use it is the way that we often get the answer from, from, uh, from the old interview that we've been conducted. So lack of communications on the, uh, on the impact of agrochemical uh, product overuse on the crop is also missing. And also uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the fragmented value chain also gaffing into the different to promote it or to, or to disseminate it, the knowledge and as well the effort among the, among the farmers. Uh, a family they also coming coming also from the interview we see that uh, there's lack of demonstration on use on use uh, and uh, and the advantage of biological product versus the versus conventional one is also something that the, that the farmer is looking for. Uh, the opportunities for the uh, can, yeah please for the opportunities for the product that uh, the from the Dutch product uh, next uh, the previous slide Lee embers. Yes. In terms of opportunity, we see that uh, uh, the Vietnamese still have to rely, so heavily rely on all the input, not only for crop protection, but for seed, fertilizer. This is really a very large market for all of the Europeans in general and, and, and the, the Dutch products uh, uh, from many years. Uh, and we still still have to continue to rely on the imported product, giving the, the low investment into the, into the input farming from the local input farming. Um, 
another reputation and very strong public favor for EU biological product. There is something that's been confirmed given many years of a successful uh, Dutch uh, enterprise that been enter and deliver really good results in crop and then use for the uh, among the Vietnamese farmers. Uh, and uh, the opportunities is also given the certain the, the, the current situation is that very limited availability of quality product in the market. That is also the risk because sometimes uh, they don't uh, the farmer cannot differentiate between the biological product. Some uh, so not not delivered that good quality, but they because they were branded with the biological product. So um, the later we are, the the the, the more serious that the, the, the farmer has been uh, has the uh, has the assumptions on the biological products, and now we see that also the increasing demand of acceptance for high quality for high high quality products, uh, especially the uh, agricultural farming input in the recent years have been accepted among the farmer, the local farmer. Yes, I think I summarized the market opportunities. Uh, so in terms of the product uh, uh, product group right segment, we see that the bio, bio pesticide, we see bio insecticide and fungicide are the fastest growing segments and have the highest potential for the in the, during the current context of the Vietnamese horticulture. See that demonstration test application training is also very important and technical support are extremely crucial. So most of the input farming fertilizer company, seed company, they always have the field force, what they call the, the technical technical engineering team that's always go into the field support, giving the uh, giving the knowledge, technical support, and transfer knowledge for the farmer. Uh, Lambda and Mekong River Delta is remaining the highest potential market for biological product, especially in Lambda, because they already one step advanced. Uh, pricing is also not a critical issue for farmer to the current available biological products. So uh, what I meant, what I meant, we mean is that uh, uh, when it comes to the biological product, uh, the farmer know that they have to pay for a premium. This is the this is the meaning for the pricing. A branded and reputational uh, biopesticide product would attract a local horticulture farmer reference. So also uh, the product that go with the brand is a very important with, uh, among the, the, the um, massive uh, uh, product and branded one that frame with the biological in the, in, in the market is something that we've been detected. I think that we summarize uh, the, the, the context from the Vietnamese horticultures, uh, please vouchers. Then you have moved, uh, Embers. Amber, we cannot hear, we cannot hear from the video clip. Uh, been in Southeast Asia for nearly 11, 12 years. Uh, working and living in Bangkok, Thailand, traveling very frequently to uh, Vietnam. And over the years, we have found that uh, many trade shows, uh, was in the trade show business for a very long time and organized trade shows like the Green Tech in Southeast Asia. And we were very fortunate to learn uh, where the market is developing to. Um, and over the line of the last decade, we, we are a big believer of uh, Vietnam's Generation Z, which is the upcoming generation and the millennials. Um, it is a very important group that will change Vietnam for good. Um, it has uh, the ability to change the culture and do a lot of um, technology and data driven things, which is uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, a very big one. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. I'll just go. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking for five, 10 minutes and please uh, ask any questions targeted if you like. And I would like to you know, manage expectations because when we look at Vietnam and the Dutch horticulture industry, there is a big misconception of technology. So we, we often tend to go very high tech while Vietnam is still going its path forward from mid tech, from low tech to mid tech. There's, there is a new way of, uh, of rethinking your models and business models and technology that is actually adoptable in Vietnam. Um, yes, sir.
Yeah, yeah, that is definitely. So that's what I try to share here is the call to make adoptable products that are functional and practical, but also economical. So if Vietnamese grower doesn't need to grow a very high tech greenhouse, and I'll be sharing a few examples uh, in a bit now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, needless to say, uh, a few uh, characteristics of the uh, challenges we all face, but um, the lack of skilled staff is a particular one because, you know, uh, the Netherlands have evolved the horticulture industry for over 60, 70 years. And uh, that came after a hunger crisis and it evolved the country to grow its food. So to expect the same thing to happen in Vietnam is, uh, is not going to happen. Um, but there is a, a new technology advancement where we could use technology to um, make it very easier for growers to, to grow a crop. So that, that, that decades of, of knowledge is also being translated in technology today, which is now in the cloud and growers can have really simple choice architecture, whether you want to grow a crop this way. So we could prepare a lot of those knowledge online and that would help Vietnam to grow faster. Uh, it definitely matches Vietnam's uh, young generation. And I really love the young generation because there's, there's so much potential in Southeast Asia. And they're so hungry to, uh, you know, to move and progress further than, than other parts. Um, another part is that also in Vietnam, climate change is impacting very largely. So everybody considers field farming not the future. And farming in Southeast Asia is not farming as in Germany or the Netherlands. It's actually considered a dirty job. Uh, growing is, however, more uh, sexy, so to say, uh, because you use data, you can grow a premium crop. And hopefully you could also sell to countries like EU and the US, which they will get a premium price and that would justify the investments they could eventually make. So the policy is super important. And without that policy, I'm really happy that the EU says, we really need to get look at those um, um, that, that, that the pest management and the use of chemicals. Um, so in other countries, it is also a challenge, but I foresee that Vietnam will go faster on this stage. So trying to go forward, can I go to the next slide? Um, so Vietnam is among a big region called Southeast Asia, or so ASEAN, where it is around 600, 650 million, 700 million people. Um, it's very dense and everybody has its own political agenda. So it's, it's a really interesting area because all the big cities of the future are based in that area. Um, how will we supply food? What is the food safety measures in the upcoming future? Will we be able to export regionally or internationally? And Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh has a really upcoming future and a bright future. Um, and we really think as Priva that, that Ho Chi Minh City will be also one of the food producing cities because of, of its Mekong Delta and Dalat, which are relatively close to the, uh, to the urban areas. Southeast Asia is very interesting. As you could not have missed it. You know, um, we have seen uh, Biden uh, putting on charms in Southeast Asia, China putting on charms. So politically it's really divided. And I'm sure some of you really know how it works. Um, Vietnam, however, really wants to progress. They really wants to want to um, be one of the winners that they will be able to pro provide and export a premium crop. Uh, some countries are playing both sides because they cannot make a choice and you cannot blame them. Some countries uh, choose to pivot more to Chinese policy and some to the, uh, to the Western policies. Um, and I think in this uh, image, it will also give you an insight that Vietnam really wants to progress and connect um, with the West on its food safety uh, and supply of food in the future. Increased demand and food production, inevitably. Uh, we already in Southeast Asia face a food scarcity. This year alone, also people are seeing inflations and next year is predicted there will be a big food disruption. So to provide um, local food is utmost important and everybody's agenda in Southeast Asia. However, Vietnam as Priva, we've created a solution that is low to mid tech, uh, requires a low capital and also the ability to 
grow on low energy consumption and still protective cropping. Uh, though we are not at the level of, of, of other countries, of uh, the Netherlands or, or Japan, it's still, still a far way to go, but it offers the growth caravan perspective. The generations um, of growers and farmers is in Vietnam very different. So we see biosecurity, the use of chemicals and the scarcity of resources being one of the key drivers. Um, Vietnam is a big lettuce cons consumer and also the greenhouse allowed them to grow vine crops, which uh, offers them also to grow, you know, a good crop that they will be able to export to also Japan. Asian, Asian herbs are one of the nicest uh, teams that we have learned this year. So there's the category Asian herbs and also um, leafies that they'll be able to export to China and Japan mm -hmm. and also Thailand. Um, and, you know, what we really like about Vietnam is that in Vietnam, things are very fast scalable. So the culture that you do, you, you make a proof of concept, it works. The next day, it could take off very fast. And to put it in comparison with the Netherlands, you, you have more niche project. That project is not going to scale five or six times in that continent. So in Vietnam, if you have a very good uh, proof of concept uh, in Dalat or in Mekong, it can go very fast. But again, low, low, low capex, uh, easy, accessible, practical and economical for the next five years. And fortunately enough, Priva has those technologies and we have we have not used them globally, but now in Southeast Asia, we're, we're doing very well. Um, though we're not making like big bucks, we're investing in the future. And I think companies who would like to join us on this mission needs to, need to have that same, same approach, the long-term approach. Um, so the ability to copy a farmer's brain and knowledge is now also in the cloud and through smart controls. We could give in the local language very simple choices for uh, the grower how to grow a crop. And it's really brought down to baby language, A, B, C choices, but it offers, it does all the thinking and it does all the, all the hard work and the set points, you know, with the 60,000 set points here in the Netherlands, you need to do to automate a greenhouse and make it function very well. We could do it with two or three actions nowadays. So, yeah, um, I think, like over the last decade in 2010 the greenhouses were introduced poly mostly um, glass houses don't breathe very well and they often um, backfire because it's too hot and too humid um, so the ability to grow also on lowlands needs to have a poly greenhouse which ventilates very well um, direct to, to consumer in vietnam is a big enabler because in, in the COVID, we saw a lot of people selling their produce directly on e-commerce, e cutting the supermarket gives them a 30% margin to reinvest to better quality foods. So premium goods are actually sold direct to consumer now instead of uh, big supermarkets that press the cost reduction. Um, we, we see supermarkets being in trouble. You know, we did a few seminars and supermarkets really see a big disruption coming because that vital part being supplied out of the supermarket is a big issue. In 22, we see more lack of growers, but we can substitute it with smart controls and people can do more with less. And the big ones, successful ones like Fineco, Peng Group, Masan in Vietnam will continue to grow bigger and do more, but they will use smarter controls. So like Vietnam might have, might have 10 times or 100 times the growers than the Netherlands, the facilities will grow bigger. The number will decline of growers, but it will be able to do more with technology. And the ability to use just a smart control of 15 to 20 K US on one hectare is the call to action today. Because it, that will enable to make all the improvements in the next next decade. Um, I think Vietnam is able to do more transparency with uh, with uh, the food chain than other countries. And in 23, I, I predict that will be more collective initiatives in Vietnam to comply to exports. Um, so stage one, data-driven versus cr protected cropping, to give you a comparison what the, where the priorities are. Um, so we, we are in Vietnam, we're focusing on protective cropping, um, crop uh, saving resources. Um, and later in 23, 24, we will head more to a CEA uh, uh, controlled environment of growing uh, with a few big companies. And hopefully they set the good example 
to uh, to scale. Um, today's perspective, what we could do in Vietnam, even though a low control technology will be able to give them practical insights what they need to do in their own language. And everybody in Vietnam has frog leap the uh, technology part. Uh, simple call to action, everybody has a phone, what to do, um, very practical insights. So you do not need to have decades of experience. I just lost my slide, but uh, so the, the, the resolvement in Vietnam is really an easy technology that's practical. Um, and I really think that when you go to Vietnam and you address the right issues with a customized approach, you will have a um, decade long or maybe longer future. Um, one of the good examples is like seed companies today, like uh, Reichswan or East West Seed. That knowledge transfer part that they do is absolutely vital for, uh, for things they uh, they're doing. I can go to the next slide. The next slide touches base on Mekong. Mekong Delta has a huge lifeline of water. That water is being toxicated now, but the, the water also offers the opportunity to clean water and reuse farmland water um, for greenhouses and poly greenhouses in the region. There is a lot of initiatives being done and assessment to clean water, reuse that water before it's discharged in the Mekong and reuse that water in, in farmlands. That is gives the um, growers a big ability to save cost. Yeah, the most important thing that I would recommend everybody in this fair, don't start doing business remotely. Be, set up a small office or a rep office in Vietnam. It's a small investment. Uh, Full-time employment is a, a fourth or a fifth of the employment in the, in the Netherlands. And it gives you the dedication and commitment to the market to continuously improve. So area managers that travel to Vietnam, stop doing that. Build relationships and really uh, give practical tools and insights locally and help them to improve them. It will be accelerating much faster. And hurdles, no, they are not there anymore. So um, with that said, I, I would like to thank Larive and Wouter for giving me the opportunity to share what we are doing. And positive perspective to invest in Vietnam. Thank, Thank you. you, Manuel. Oh, Manuel. <laughs> no, Manuel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Manuel. And thank you so much also uh, on the webinar itself. So what we would like to do is, uh, whilst the technology is being worked on, open the floor for questions. Um, Amber, have you received any questions in the chat box that you can share? And at the same time, if we have a mic for the public here and there's any questions, then it's going to be audible as well for those on the webinar. Um, I actually, to start off, uh, Manuel, I do have a question for you, um, uh, combined with what um, Mintam was saying. You were very much promoting low-tech, mid-tech, and at the same time, I heard Mintam say that prices for biological products are actually less critical. Consumers yeah. know that there is a, a let's say, a margin to be had. What's your take on the growth of, let's say, the biological uh, uh, market within Vietnam, so not even export focus, but for local market purposes? I think uh, you know, the retailers and direct to consumers will have unique USPs to disrupt food choices. Those USPs, especially in the DTC mm -hmm. channel, mm -hmm. they will talk about clean food, pesticide free, free food for, and they are doing it very aggressively, healthy living. And that would really challenge people to rethink what they're buying and that will drive biological approach. Um, I, it's unfortunate that it's not been driven by, uh, by supermarkets and we have seen disruption coming in every industry. If you're not being uh, not innovating, you will be disrupted sooner or later. Um, I would have rather seen supermarkets say, hey, this is a category that actually stimulates to get cancer, then nobody would bet, buy that product. Uh, but now the DTC, uh, you know, young entrepreneurs, they're doing it. Biological crop protection is inevitable. Lovely. Willem, I'm not sure if you're still there from Hanoi, but we had a question for you as well. You mentioned, um, let's say, the public support instruments, and they're also outlined in, uh, in the report. Maybe from your view as agriculture attaché, can you give us a little bit of your thoughts on what you expect to happen in the next three years in terms of developments? 
towards, let's say, the usage and uh, application of biological crop protection? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wouter, for, for asking me that question. And um, I think I think it was already said maybe by yourself that that seeing is believing. And, and, and that's also what we see in, uh, in examples that we already have on the ground, that if you are able uh, to join forces with a group of companies locally based and, and from the Netherlands and, and maybe involving research as well, <laughs> and you can really show what uh, what kind of difference you can make in the field then farmers will starting believe you and then we will also be convinced investing in in the products or the concept we are selling so i strongly believe in that um, when it comes to instruments um, i always strongly believe when there is a good plan uh, we will also find budget and uh, of course there is a, a existing instrumentarium uh, through orfeo uh, through the ps toolkit but also others also internationally, sometimes there are possibilities to find proper funding. And um, if you ask me for the developments in, in, in the near future, I think this is uh, still also a phase where public-private relationship can really make a difference. And if, if you uh, give a perspective to a couple of years, I think it will change. It will change in more private-to-private uh sector development and um it, it goes really rapid it goes really rapidly uh, the vietnam is moving into a middle a high middle income country um if they want to make their ambitions uh, true they 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 should and they will invest in uh, in further uh, quality improvement uh, adding value to their products and they will get there so uh, this this is for sure, and I think it was uh, also uh, said by uh, by Manuel. This might also be the time to to step in. Um, and and my call would be if you have a good idea, um, just reach out also to the embassy and let's see what we can do in terms of bringing you into contacts or uh, bringing you into contact of other uh, people that also want to move forward in this country. Thank you, Willem. Much appreciated. Mindam, maybe a question to you. Um, from all of the interviews that you've done in Vietnam, and when you look at the Vietnamese perspective towards the solutions offered from the Netherlands, I mean, is there, let's say, uh, a key learning that you were able to derive from all those interviews with growers, but also with traders all the way down the value chain? Is there anything that you would say to those present today that say, hey, that's one of the key issues that came out that would be worthy of working on for the next three years? Um, yes, uh, thank you for your question, Vouchers. Uh, I do believe that uh, all of the, the case summary that I got in from the conducting with the, directly with the farmers or the exporters is that the perception on the on the biological products. So I've just mentioned that there are demonstrations that we require. The answer that I got from the farmer is that they said that this is too complicated to apply. This is the, the complicated and also the impact and also the differences versus the conventional product, and also in the longer, longer uh, impact, uh, like the longer effects. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, that is what I heard is like the, truly the feeling of the user, and I think that is why demonstration and also technical support knowledge transfer is very important to impact for the biological product in Vietnam in the, in the next three years. It must be coming from the first is from the knowledge and also the awareness. That is the, the government, the local government had been trying to do from the from the top, the top down, but also at the stakeholder. We do looking for us to the bottom up, uh, the improving in the knowledge and especially from the advances uh, technology from the nil and is something that uh, that is uh, necessary for the developments of the sectors. Thank you. Bottom up. I've noted it down. Thank you, Mentam. I was told to be a critical timekeeper and I think we're one minute out um, of closing down. So what I wanted to do is just make a few closing remarks. Um, importantly, uh, I think both reports will be available online for download and we'll share the link. Um, as well, we shall share the link to this recording for all of those who actually had to man their booths. Um, a big, big thank you to Willem and his team for making this possible and really driving uh, from, from the first discussion forward saying, look, now that we have that Europe-Vietnam free trade agreement, what is there to be done to make the next step? So really taking a leap forward and thinking ahead, what is there to be done in terms of cooperation? A huge thank you to you, Manuel, for taking the time of being present Thanks and overcoming all technical 
difficulties and a huge uh, thank you to the organization here of the green tech and those behind the it thank you very much have a lovely day